Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited. I don't know if you guys saw Boy the Lord is so good. I mean, you know, we had this fundraising going on to get it, you know, into shape twofold. And the first was to get it, you know, functional year round with heat and things like that. And then the second part of that was to prepare for the revival coming up because it's, you know, be several hundred people here. A lot of expenses are going to be incurred to make it happen. So, but anyway, uh, last week we got this anonymous donation of $5,000. It was unbelievable. Uh, I just cried like a baby and, uh, you know, just, I couldn't believe it. And so in the portal for GoFundMe, you can send a thank you and then it directly through the system. And so of course I did. And then when the person email me back, their their name was showing in the email. So I was nosy. I just wanted to see, I know they'll be anonymous, but it's uh, a lady on Facebook. I am connected to her, wouldn't have a clue about anything else. Just She just said, I know, I just feel that the Holy Spirit's telling me big things are happening. I want to be a part of it. So look at God. God, he just, uh, he amazes me. I think he's getting on there, Denise. He's there, Daryl. He figured it out. He's he's connected to audio. His audio is off. But... Yeah, he's 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 muted. Well, you might have you're not gonna stay muted, are you? There you go. No, ma'am. Oh, good. How are you feeling? You got you got the crud, huh? Well, I um I have been feeling pretty cruddy for a week, but I'm making a comeback, and um, I wanted to make sure I didn't miss a word tonight. <laughs> Well, good, 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 good. Well, I'll be praying for you. I'm sorry you're not feeling well. So, oh, that's okay, Lee. Thank you. Speaking of, it looks like this is going to be it tonight. And, you know, uh, where two or more are gathered. So it's never about numbers in this group. I'm really happy to have every every one of you with us. So let's open it up in prayer. I'll do that. We'll get right on with it and see what the Lord has for us all. Gracious Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we just love you, Lord. And we just thank you so much for your word, for your spirit, Lord, just for burning this message out there uh, through your spirit on my heart to share tonight. I know I've been convicted this week myself. And Lord, we just give this time, we give every single word to you, Lord. And we just, with everything within us, we just want to glorify you, Lord, and 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 have you find us pleasing. So we give it all to you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, now let's see if Lynn can do her thing and get the screen up there. It's always, you know, is she going to be a blonde tonight or is she actually going to function? So <laughs> you just never know when you get on these things with me, right? A little bit slow here. Looks like, a, you know, kind of a similar message that we had recently, but it is different. I promise you it's uh, open my eyes that I may see. And so I'm real, uh, I'm not, I'm excited to get this uh, kind of a shift in my own life going on. I'm really excited what the Lord might have. But, you know, we know if you if you cut your teeth on a Baptist hymnal or in a hymnal, then, you know, the, the hymn opened my eyes. In fact, when you saw this, it probably came to mind. You might be hearing that in your head right now. If we don't watch Denise, she'll start singing it. But open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me. Oh, I love that part. It's like, light me up, Lord. Illumine me, spirit divine. What a beautiful hymn that is. And uh, it just we kind of jump-started everything we have for tonight. But open our eyes to what? You know, as Christians, there's a lot we need to open our eyes to. You know, of course, to Jesus Christ for salvation. If the veil's never lifted, we never find our way to Christ. You know, to open uh, our eyes to the Holy Spirit for guidance. If you don't tap into the source of our guidance through this life, you're lost. Uh, to his word for wisdom and truth, to the uh, unsaved, open our eyes to the unsaved people, open our eyes to the suffering, and certainly open our eyes to the battle we're, we're in today. So yeah, there's a whole lot of open our eyes that we need to kind of look at tonight. But the reference to, you know, open eyes or blindness is pretty common in the Bible. In some cases, it's a sign, you know, of, of, when Christ, of Christ's healing power. Um, you know, that we, uh, when Jesus gave sight to the blind man, uh, we remember that in John 9, right? So we see that kind of thing, the physical healing, if you will. The closed eyes, on the other hand, is sometimes a metaphor uh, for avoiding the truth, you know, as is in the case of John 12, 40, as when Christ was uh, entering into Jerusalem, you know, on his journey to the cross, 
he said, he hath blinded their eyes. Who's he? He is God. He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. And so here we are again, you open eyes, closed eyes. We have the physical thing that we talk about, but the blindness we're going to talk about or the open eyes tonight is a spiritual thing, obviously. So there are a couple of things that I want to call attention to. First is open our eyes to substance. You know, in Hebrews 11, uh, 1, we read now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so we're going to uh, kind of p- take everything from there. You know, just as our physical eyesight is, the, is a sense that gives us evidence of material things. I see you, you see me, you know, we can see the tangible things, you know, because of the eyesight and our sense there. Uh, Faith is a sense, so to speak, that gives us evidence of things not seen, the invisible, the spiritual world. And so there is a a, a big difference there with that evidence. But the word for substance uh, that uh, King James and New King James use that, uh, you know, announced substance is the things hoped for. It's alternately translated um, in other uh, translations here. In the ESV, it's assurance. In the NIV, it's confidence. And in the NLT, it's the reality. But in the original Greek, it's a lot bigger and deeper than that. That term conveys the idea of a firm foundation, the real deal, so to speak, actual existence, substantial in nature, a, a, a resolute trust. It's, it's, it's a little bit more, right, than just thinking, well, it's assurance and confidence and reality. Our sense of the word refers to uh, a title deed, you know, coming from real estate, that's, <laughs> that's unbreakable. It's a title deed or it's a legal document guaranteeing the right to possess a property. It's a sealed deal. The, 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 the substance is our, the meat and potatoes of our faith, right? It's what we lean on, it's who we are. According to Moulton and Milligan and vocabulary, the Greek te- New Testament, uh, that faith as being the substance, uh, it could be translated, faith is the title deed for things hoped for, the very things we hope for, we can stand on the promises of God. And that's the title deed, it's secured, it's a done deal uh, forever and ever, amen. But another commentary suggests that faith, I love this quote, apprehends reality. How cool is that? It apprehends reality, is that it is that to which the unseen objects of hope become real and substantial. I have uh, clipped that out for my, to, to see every day, I love that unseen objects of hope become real and substantial. We can bank on it. Faith is the uh, substance of things hoped for, uh, describes a conviction that already, you know, takes custody. It's here and now it's done of what we hope for and what God has promised us in the future. So today, as we are beginning those birth pains, you know, we're definitely entering into perilous times. And I think personally, we ain't seen anything yet, right? You know, we have more going on and, and, and we've got that global pandemics, you know, in quotes there, uh, you know, heating up again. Again, and threats of closing borders, all that stuff. Financial crisis that has not even begun to take place. It's going to be tragic. Uh, social unrest. You know, our world seems to be falling apart when we look at it with the human eye and not with the spiritual eye. You know, but we can stand on the rock solid, unshakable promises of God's security and rest and peace and provision, mercy, grace, and our salvation. His word can absolutely be trusted. When we look at a world full of lies, we know that his word can be trusted. That's our substance. We can have full confidence in the Lord's promises because they're real and they're our firm foundation for this life. So having said that, why in the world would we even open our eyes to the world? Why do we even look at it? Why do we focus on it? Why do we talk about it? Why do we ponder it? You know, we have the substance and our hope already done. It's a title deed to our future. Substance or assurance describes an inward response, if you will, to God's unfailing nature. So we can be sure of the Lord's promises because biblical heroes of every generation have proven them to be true. And of course, Hebrews uh, you know, 11 is such a beautiful picture of this. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering and the Cain dead. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he's dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. By faith, Noah built the ark, saved his family, and became an heir of righteousness. By faith, 
Abraham obeyed God and moved from his homeland. It's just so beautiful because of the substance. The writer of Hebrews, and I, I, I put it this way because as you probably know, uh, you know, Bible commentators, scholars have debated who wrote certain books of the Bible and they you know, generally come to agreement, but Hebrews is one they, they never could get 100% vote on who, who wrote Hebrews. Some say it was Paul, some say it was Priscilla who traveled with Paul, but we know God Almighty wrote Hebrews. So Hebrews uh, presents an example after example of those uh, who demonstrated faith as the substance of those things hoped for. And it, I love that it says all these people were still living by faith when they died. You know, I want to be found living by faith when I die. I don't want to lose hope and lose faith. I've got substance. You know, they did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. That's who we are. From the you know, the uh, patriarchs to King David to anonymous champions of faith, believers have trusted in God's promises despite enduring unimaginable challenges. And when we look at uh, the saints and the people, you know, throughout the Bible and what they endured, my, my goodness, if we have no cause to whine, right? Then, and, and verse 38 says, the world was not worthy of them. You've heard me say that before, what a beautiful thing it would be, you know, to be considered that the world was not worthy of me. Faith being the substance of things hoped for is also an outward force. You know, possessing the reality of hope supplies us all with the motivation to endure because we have the substance, we have the title deed, right? Now uh, we can endure trials and hardships and all those things in our life because of that. Faith as a substance, of things hoped for activates us to preach boldly, you know, to pray unceasingly, to love unconditionally, to serve compassionately, and to work tirelessly as, you know, day after day. The inward substance of faith moves our hearts while the external reality moves mountains. What a beautiful thing that is, right? And then we need to open our eyes to truth. That sounds pretty simple and a call with believers here. Sounds pretty basic and simple, but we really need to focus on a couple of things. So where does genuine truth come from? Well, through his word and through his spirit. So if you aren't diligently in his word and relying on his spirit, you can easily be deceived. You know, we are warned over and over as the time draws near, you know, about false prophets, false teacher being deceived. And I tell you, you're not immune to it and I'm not either. We've got to stay in the word and we've got to embrace his spirit through everything we endure. You know, studies reflect that the average professed Christian, at least, spends 15 minutes a week in the word and 30 minutes a week in prayer. Now, I got to tell you that 15 minutes is probably when they open their Bible or they open their Bible app in the, in the church service and then 30 minutes a week in prayer. That, that, that's just horrible. How can you, uh, you know, spend so little time with the Lord and expect to, you know, enjoy the provisions and, and to not be deceived? Teachers, preachers, uh, all of us called by God to, or we're called to guide, okay? You know, believers are called by God to search for the truth. So you always have to weigh it out and measure it out. And I, for one, I think, um, you know, humility is an important part of all of this, you know, and should I ever speak something that someone thinks maybe that's not quite, we're going to sit down with our Bibles and hash it out, okay? Because I don't want to be speaking an untruth. And and no, I'm sure, you know, most of the people out there sharing the word of God or guiding people through the word don't either. We're held to a different, you know, uh, standard, if you will. So believers are called by God to search for the truth, which means it's not up to you and to me to scrutinize every word and to critique every sermon and to be negative and to be looking for trouble. That's not what it is. But when you know the truth so well, you'll recognize trouble when it shows up. So we're, we're called by God to search for that truth on our own, being guided, of course, you know, by pastor or teacher, your leader, whatever that looks like in your world. Uh, but we're called by God to search for that truth on our own. First John 4, 1 says, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. We're going to circle back around to that in just uh, a couple of weeks. Uh, Jude 1, for for certain people have crept in unnoticed don't say they broke in they, they they forced their way in it says they crept in which means they're kind of a gentle you know unrecognizable unnoticed right who long ago were designated for this condemnation ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality, which means you make it attractive, tickle your ears, drawn in, right? And deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now, listen, uh, I believe that, you know, we, we tend to look at things, you know, 
uh, on a big scale. In other words, we look at people that might say, I don't believe in Jesus. He's nonsense. And to them, that's somebody denying Jesus. But, you know, if we refuse to speak the word of the Lord, if we refuse to proclaim Jesus Christ in a dark world, we really are denying him of source. But this uh, Jude 1, 4 is fascinating because it says they crept in. Nobody even saw him coming. And long ago, they were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people to pervert the grace of God. And so that happened then. It's happening now. It's going to happen more in the future. Matthew 7, 13, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Now, you know, again, uh, we, we look at the prophets. I know through the throughout the last couple of years, there's been a lot of prophecy spoken and you know, I, for one, have not scrutinized. I really don't tune into a lot of that stuff. But the bottom line is, you know, not all prophets speaking a word are, are, are true. You know, we uh, you, you, you've heard about uh, demonic things, you know, maybe in the occult, maybe it's a, a palm reading or, or, or tarot cards or, or something like that. And I've, I've heard people say, oh, my gosh, that person knew everything about. Of course they did. It's a demonic thing. Right. They're, so my point is that not everything looks like that, that looks good is good. And so we have to test the spirit to see, is it of God? So if you don't open your eyes to truth through his word and if you don't rely on the Holy Spirit for wisdom, discernment of the truth, how can you expect to recognize anything false? Right. I can tell you, as for me, I'm not a Bible scholar. But I, you know, one thing I am, I, I go after Jesus like a pit bull with a bone. I want to know everything. I want to learn everything. I seek him. I chase him. I want to know everything. And then I'm humble enough to ask for wisdom and discernment in every year of my life. And frankly, guys, if, if it's that way for you, you can't go wrong. You can't be deceived. If you're loving him and chasing him with every fiber of you and you're relying on him to guide you, you know, through his spirit with the truth. So, but we can't expect to, to recognize false things, you know, if we aren't giving that time and attention in our walk. You know, cults, that's another thing. People think big things. If I say cult, you might think uh, David Koresh or uh, uh, Jim Jones or Heaven's Gate or one of these huge high profile uh, newsworthy kind of cults, right? But a cult doesn't have to be that big. You know, it can be easily drawing people in with lies. You know, but the cults, cults have a common denominator. They look for, they prey on people who are lonely or scared, or maybe they're just lost in life. Maybe they're confused or they, they have a need to belong and they're vulnerable. And you know what, guys? Boy, you could look across America after the COVID shutdown nonsense and people, you know, removed from their churches and stuff like that. And, and, and then a lot of people falling on that list are vulnerable. And so cults have a way of drawing those people in. And so, you know, it, it doesn't have to be a, a complete idiot got drawn in. I remember I may have shared with you before, uh, you know, a friend of mine that I just, you know, was a baby Christian. I mean, I'm talking really baby Christian. And she just seemed, she, you know, came to the Lord in her teens and, I just thought I'd never get there. And a pastor came into their church. And boy, I'll tell you one thing that absolutely turned into a cult. And it was very troubling as a new believer. And again, I, I, I'm humble enough to say, Lord, teach me. I just had a discerning spirit about what was going on. You never would have thought, but my friend, she was going through a lonely time. She was scared about her future. She had lost a relationship. She's kind of confused and she had a need to belong like you can't believe. She was very, very vulnerable. And that's how it happened. So you know, the moral of that story is open your eyes because that could happen to anybody if we're not in his word, if we're not relying on the spirit. You got to you know, put the time into your relationship with Jesus. And then we open our eyes to the miraculous. Now, I don't know where you come from. I still believe in miracles. I believe it's biblical and I believe in miracles. And I, you know, I'm not going to ever say that miracles are dead. They went away. They don't exist because they do exist. First Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels. Now, this doesn't say, though I used to, and though I'm just thinking about it. It's, it, it's, it's stating, though I speak with tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. In other words, it's worthless, right? And though I have the gift of prophecy, not I wish I had, maybe I'll have, although I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I could remove, mount, remove, remove mountains, but have not love, I have nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feel, feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, which means as a, a you know living sacrifice, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love never fails. 
But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. So when you open your eyes to the scripture, what you see is what it said. So many churches, in fact, rely on this scripture to say, but hey, but what, when that which perfect has come, it, they, they say that was Jesus. And that's not Jesus. So that which is perfect, the Bible scholars argued a little bit. That could be that that which is perfect when we die and, you know, we go to heaven. There's no need for any of this stuff anymore. It could be the second coming of Christ, but it's not a capital P it's that which is perfect so it's it's likely you know referring to when this life is over when we have our new body in Christ when we're in heaven you know that we won't have a need it'll all be done away but those gifts you know still exist today and if you have seen them abused in any way doesn't mean they don't exist it means they're being abused and so I still believe in miracles and I think that we all need to open our eyes to what God does here's a miracle for you got a couple that uh it's so encouraging you know you read in Judges 7 if you haven't read that or read it in a while you want to go read the whole thing i'm just bringing the highlights here tonight but um i, I want to point something out to you for your life and mine early in the morning gideon and all his men camped at the spring of herod the camp of midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of mora the lord said to gideon you have too many men now pause right there you know they know that that the midianites have 135,000 men okay massive army so here's god saying to gideon you have too many men can you imagine going to war and any commanding officer anybody saying hey you got too many people but god see god wanted to make it abundantly clear that it was him that won the war so he says i cannot deliver midian into their hands or israel would boast about me my own strength has saved me so there'd be some arrogance there some confusion you know was it there in their you know their ability to fight was it god right so he wanted to make sure that that, that they knew that he showed up so announced to the army anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave mount gilead so uh, you know uh a wall right <laughs> nobody's gonna get penalized for walking away from this and so twenty-two thousand men left there were thirty-two thousand. 22,000 left, 10,000 remain. God bless the 10,000, right? I mean, you look at these poor guys and say, hey, there's 32,000 of us and 135,000 of them. I'm surprised they didn't all run off like wussies. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. The I mean, year is down to 10,000, right? Take them down to the water and I will thin them out for you there. If I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. And so Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, separate those who lap water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. 300 of them drank from cup tans lapping like dogs and the rest got down on their knees to drink. Now, commentators say that in all likelihood, uh, what they were looking at is, you know, the ones that got down on their knees and knelt to drink directly from the water had their eye off the ball so the 300 that actually got water in their hands and lapped it up that's probably why we don't know but nonetheless it got shrunk down to 300 and the lord said to gideon with the 300 men that lapped i will save you and give you the midianites into your hands let all the others go home so gideon sent the rest of the israelites home but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and trumpets of the other. Again, you want to read the whole story because we went, okay? But the whole the whole thing is that, you know, when you look at your life and you say, I can't do it. I don't have enough help to do it. I don't have enough money to do it. I, whatever you're, you know, I don't have enough of. God doesn't need more. And so he took this army to prove himself that you don't have to have 135 men to 135 men. You don't even need 32,000. If you don't need 10,000, he took 300 men and won that battle. And you know what? He does the same for me and he can do the same for you. So we have to open our eyes to miraculous things. And we, we will never have the mind of God. We don't even need to try. But we do need to understand that he is a God of miracles. He is a way maker. And sometimes he withholds holds things, you know, so that it, the glory is even greater if that's possible, right? So it's so obviously that he showed up that the world is blown away. And so I think that's a great example of opening our eyes. In 2 Kings 6, we're reading about Elisha. And now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. Israel, war, 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 right? After conferring with his offers, he, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. And the man of God, who was Elisha, 
sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God or Elisha. Time and again, Elisha warned the king. So Elisha, God was revealing what was going to happen. Elisha was telling, you know, the, the, the king. And so that uh, so that he was on his guard in, in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded them, tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel. And of course, he was looking for a traitor in their own camp. None of us, my lord, the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet who's in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. In other words, there ain't nothing he doesn't know. So go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. So the report came back. He's in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots, you know, so he's, he's armed and ready. I'm going to go after this guy. And he sends all of his forces and his chariots and everything. And they went in the night and surrounded this city. So in the morning, when the servant of the man of God, or Elisha's servant, he got up early, went out the next morning, and he saw an army of horses and chariots surround his city. Now, imagine if that's you. You wake up, and you're like, we're surrounded. He said, oh, oh, no, my Lord. What shall we do? The servant asked. And he said, don't be afraid. The prophet answered, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. What a beautiful thing. You should keep that scripture embedded in your heart. Elijah hadn't looked out there. He just said, don't be afraid. He already understood the spiritual army that the Lord would send to protect him, right? And Elijah prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked out and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. As the enemy came down toward them, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. So here we are, you know, again, you, you know, what we can't see, you know, we talk about this a lot. We, we try to you know, assume what God's doing. It's not worth even trying. We're never going to figure out what God's doing. We just have to go back to the substance and, and, and what we can, what we can lean on, the hope that we have and knowing that we have the title deed to it. We can't understand the way he works, but he always shows up. And so in this case, you know, he revealed the heavens just so the servant could see. You don't have anything to worry about. I've got you covered. I can't even imagine. I wouldn't want to see in the heavenly realms, to be honest with you. I mean, the angels would be cool, but the demons would scare me. So I don't, I don't want to see out there in the heavenly realms, but I know it exists and I know that it's taken place nonstop, but I know we need to fight it. And so what a beautiful picture that is that the Lord would show this servant what was out there. And then that Elisha had no uh, second thoughts at all. He had no concern, no doubt or anything. He just said, Lord, show him. He already knew the Lord had it. You need to know that. And I need to know that, that we are surrounded and protected. And then open our eyes to those in need. Oh boy. It's all, we, we get on this sometimes. And a couple of you just share my heart there. You know, we have to look out for those in need as a part of our walk. It's, it's expected of us. It, it should be a natural flow in your faith that you would watch out for those in need. Well, what need? Well, spiritual needs should be number one above all else. It doesn't really matter uh, in a bigger picture, if you will, if the practical needs aren't matter, the financial needs, if they're destined for hell. So whoever we meet, whatever we do, whatever uh, ordained moment God gives to us, that should be the first and foremost that, you know, we should be ministering to the spiritual needs of that person. But all of these things, guess what? They require sacrifice. And we're only willing to make those sacrifices if we have our eyes open to the bigger picture of substance. Otherwise, we cop out. When we look at if you did a, a, a search, you know, of your own life and, it, you know, kind of an inventory of what it's looked like, let's just say since the beginning of the year. And how many people have you ministered to spiritually, practically, financially? That should be a good place to start to go back to the substance that we have that 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 just uh, propels us to do the work of the Lord. First John 3, 17, 18 says, if anyone has material possessions, sees a brother or sister in need, has no pity on them. Some translations say compassion on them. How can the love of God be in that person? You know, when I read that, every time I read that, I think, oh, please, God, don't let that be me. That, you know, that, that it would be questioned that is the love of God even in her? Um, that she has material possessions and she had no compassion. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. You know, it's kind of a lame journey um, if we, you know, talk the talk, but we don't walk the walk. 
you know, if we say we pray, but we don't go out and actually, you know, do practical things to help people. Proverbs 22, 9, the generous will themselves be blessed for they share their food with the poor. Isaiah 58, 10. And if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. In other words, you'll be blessed for that. Deuteronomy 1511, for there will never cease to be poor in the land. We don't understand that. That's something that, you know, as you're witnessing the people, they'll they'll often bring up, why is, a lot, why is God allow this? I don't know. But there'll always be, uh, you know, poor in the land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy, and to the poor in your land. You know, when you read the Bible, we see so many examples of it, you know, like the threshing floor. You know, they didn't, you know, take up the, the entire crop. They left it. So the threshing floor was for the poor people to come gather. And, you know, they would leave crumbs, you know, at the king's table, all this stuff. But not us, man. You got a dumpster dive if you don't have anything or go to the government. So we should be, uh, you know, have our open wide our hand to our brother, but our eyes have to be open to be willing to open our hand. Matthew 16, 25, 26. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, it will find it. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? There, if the soul is priceless, right? So what's going to profit uh, somebody, you know, to hang on to their money or to do not do for the needy or to just store it up, store it up, store it up, you know, if it's if it means, uh, you know, losing their soul. And hey, guy, uh, two, eight, you hear often uh, from me, of course, and you do the same, I'm sure. But the Lord says the silver is mine. And the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. They're, they're, listen, he's pretty straightforward there. So every single penny you ever had in your hand or put in your pocket belonged to him. Not just that 10 percent. If you tie, then you're proud to say it. It's not just the 10 percent. It all belongs to him. So if he puts somebody in your path, you know, somebody that you should be ministering to, you just remember it's not mine, it's God's and, and give freely. Right. To minister. And then we open our eyes to the times. You know, where are we in the whole bigger picture of this journey of life? Well, you know, we know that we're coming to the end. I mean, prophecy has been fulfilled. So that part's clear. What does that mean? I don't know. It could be today. It could be a thousand years from today, but we need to open our eyes to the times and always be mindful of the times. Luke 21, 28. Now, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Now, listen, this doesn't mean necessarily uh, a physical looking up, although probably does you know, part, in part. But it's that look, it's, as long as we're looking for him, as long as we understand that our redemption draws near, that's going to keep us on our toes. So now these things begin to happen. They're happening. Most of them have happened. It's time to look up and lift our heads. It's time to keep our eyes open to the fact that the time is near. You know, Matthew 24. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, People were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Now, stop right there for a second. Okay, listen, they, those were horrible days. I mean, God, I'm sure, you know, it wasn't just a mild sin issue because God said, I regret ever creating this mess. And I'm going to bring a flood and I'm going to I'm going to start all over again. And I'm going to begin with Noah and his family. So this was not a pretty world either. Okay, for God to, 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 to decide to destroy it. But nonetheless, even though it was ugly and sinful and whatever was going on, there they were eating and drinking and being merry, right? They were minding their own business. They were having a good time, enjoying life up until the day they entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So, you know, we're going to be out there. And even though it's an ugly, dark world, plenty of people are not going to care. They're not going to open their eyes to where we are right now. Therefore, they're not going to prepare their hearts for where we are right now. And so, you know, we can look at the at the word and, and always find the nugget that we need for today. And that's a good example. Matthew 24, 24. Therefore, you must also be ready for the son of man is coming at an hour you do not expect. We can sit there and theorize and prophecy and then now this war and then, you know, earthquakes. We can do that until the cows come home, but we will not know the hour, which is uh, all the more reason we need to live as if it's right now. And, and that's the whole, uh, you know, idea of being focused on the on the end. First Thessalonians 5, 2. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Look, I love that. You know, it's not like 
you've all, it's like you already know this, okay? You're fully aware that it's coming like a thief in the night. So prepare like it's coming like a thief in the night. You know, if you had a thief to, to guard from thieves, if you will, or preparations you do, you make sure to take certain steps, right? You know, so that thief in the night can't come to your home. Well, we need to prepare. And, and, and because we know we don't know the time uh, of, of, his, of his coming. And so, again, open my eyes, illumine me, spirit divine. So we look at the substance again, you know, that the title deed to our future that should propel us to everything else by opening our eyes and, and believing in all those things we cannot see. And the truth, <laughs> get into the truth. I'm, I'm telling you, these times, are it's never been more important. We've said this week after week, you know, I know. You should know. Uh, and, and instead of wringing our hands, we should be confident that we were born for such a time as this. I know God had plans for me to do what I do for him for such a time as this. So they're, they're crazy times, but they could also be the most exciting times of your entire life, especially the spiritual side of your life. You know, so dig into the truth. The guys don't give up on the miraculous. It ha- miracles happen every day. And they always will. And if we suppress that and say, well, that was for then and that was an ax thing or, you know, we don't, God doesn't roll that way. You, you're just being lied to because we still serve a God of miracles. He's the way maker. And he's the same God that, you know, controlled the numbers for the Gideon and Elisha and the army. He's the same God. And so we have in some ways kind of lost our luster uh, for him because we, you know, just don't look at the miracles. And then the needy, it's going to get worse. You know that. I know that. Uh, you know, we're just more and more people. More than anything, they need Jesus. But after we uh, understand the condition of their heart, we minister them spiritually. We meet those practical needs as well. Because if you look at the ministry of Christ, a lot of people were, you know, came to their faith because he met their needs. Mary, for instance, you know, was delivered of all those demons. I think it was seven demons, right? Delivered of the demons. She was so stinking grateful. You know, she was one of the financial uh, providers. Uh, uh, Mary, Susanna, Joanna, they were they financially supported the ministry of Christ because they were so grateful. And so we need to look out for the needy. Jesus did it. We need to do it. Uh, you know, we don't need to just be hanging out with the good church people. We need to go where the people who need Jesus are, just like Jesus did. And then again, we need to look at the end times. The time is near. We don't know what that means, but we need to live as if it's right this second, as if it's going to happen before we end this call. That's how we need to live our lives. And the complacency that we have talked about so many times has to stop. Well, the time is out, okay? We've got to stop being that complacent church that quit preaching the gospel. And, you know, I was here, I listened to a sermon this morning, and I believe it was um, 3,200 baptisms in the last two years in this one church. I got to tell you, I, there's no doubt in my mind, the, the formerly the Baptist church that I went to, I, I guarantee you, if there were two or three baptisms a year, that was a big deal. And they probably in the history, 110 year history, have never baptized 3,000 people. Why is that? Well, because people need to hear the truth. They need to be hearing the gospel. They need to be convicted. They need to have something to work toward. They need to be refined. And as long as we're given sweet little messages and just trying to, uh, you know, give that intellectual side of the Bible, not the heart side of the Bible, we're not going to see those things happen. But we pray for revival. It's time to do our part to get that revival, you know, going or, or, or growing, right? It's time for us to do our part. And it doesn't come from the head. It, uh, it comes from the heart with open eyes, you know, that we might see all these things, you know, that we might live a life worthy, that we might, the world might look at it and say, Dude, the world was not even worthy of these people, you know, that we might be found worthy by the king of all kings. And so open my eyes that I might see. And I can't end it without another uh, favorite hymn of mine that talks about, you know, blindness, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. You know, I, I do think, um, I was just sharing this recently, how with my kids, you know, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I grew up in a crazy, unchristian home. And we, we lived like gypsies and there was alcoholism and adultery and everything going on all over the place. It was a crazy life. And then I came to the Lord um, in my 30s. So I had two girls, got saved, had two boys. And uh, so I, I see my life. I remember that wretch I was. 
I know what he's done in my life. It was profound. And I wish I could share a DVD with each one of you so you could, I could show you that, that I used to be unrecognizable, right? And so I treasure that. And, and, and when I look at this, uh, this, the lyrics of this song, that's truly my heart, you know, that I, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. You know, they could pull me out of the dredges, pull me out of that miry pit, put a, you know, hymn of praise on my, on my lips. So I was once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind. But now I say, we can't afford to be blind anymore, guys. We can't afford to just have even dim vision anymore. We got to open our eyes, you know, to all those things that we talked about tonight. Chase him. He's so worthy of being chased and pursue him. Nothing in this world, you know, we'll always have an opinion or our two cents. And it's it's pretty fascinating to you know, try to look out there and try to figure out what's going on, but we're never going to figure out what's going on. And, uh, you know, because God, God's got it. He's already got a plan. It's fixed like the title deed. We can't change it. You know, we, we just have to go on with it and trust him. The same as Elijah said, no problem. There's more of us than there are them. Let's go on with it. Just show him Lord. That's the way we need to live our lives too. And so that's it. Open your eyes that you might see. So now, um, if it's the first time with us tonight, you uh, just unmute yourself. This is our time. It's not my call. And so anybody have anything to share, to talk about? I'd love to hear from you. Uh, beautiful message tonight, Lynn. Thank you so very much for that. And, and just kind of bringing us full circle back around to, you know, really realizing that God's really in control of everything. Everything. And um, we just need to remind ourselves of that on a constant basis, that he's, he's really in charge. And I know when I went back to work uh, and I, they said they wanted me to uh, fill out a thing making a request for uh, religious exemption, that was one of my things that I wrote in there. I said, God's in charge. I, I don't know what you people think, but I know that God's in charge and he's got it handled. So whatever it looks like, whatever it sounds like, he's in control. And I would rather go with his control than the government's control. Right. And, uh, and this just reminds us that that is true. You know, why else would he send away, you know, all those soldiers and, and get down to 300 out of, you know, out of the thousands that were there and then and tell the rest of them that it's okay, it's all right, it's handled. You don't need to worry. Go back to your families. Mm -hmm. I'm in control. We've got this taken care of. God's got it. That's right. God's got it. That's got and, it. and we just need to truly believe that and keep giving that message to people. That's right. Yeah, we really do. You know, and and it's uh, listen. It's not a cakewalk. I know that. You know that. We go through all these things in life. You know, but. I do know the Bible mentions fear 365 times. So God knows that we're inclined to fear. So it's a daily thing. It's not a 15 minutes a week on, on a, on a, in your Bible and a 30 minutes a week, you know, uh, praying. It's a daily thing. And as it draws near and the world gets crazier, it's more and more important. There's nothing more important in your day that you could do than spend time with the Lord. Nothing. But fear is a, a natural part. It's not acceptable necessarily. But we understand that. It's there and we need to fight against it and understand we have, we have nothing to fear because he's in control of it all. That's our title deed. It's already done. Amen. Hey, David, Boston. Hey, I'm sorry about that. I was just saying amen. Oh, well, hey, I like your amens. You got any two cents for us tonight? Uh, no, not to where I'm led. I just, well, I kind of do, but um, I just, I just, I, I, um, understand and i believe the miraculous i don't live for it but i believe it and i welcome it anytime because it says the just shall live by faith mm -hmm. uh, i just found at times too many christians hanging on to for a miracle to happen when god tells us to it's a balance it's god tells us to go for it and work and right. i believe that all the spiritual gifts that you were talking about are still alive mm -hmm. still alive and well um it's just that we have gotten so gotten so much head knowledge that yes. we have not learned how to release uh by faith and so um so just a you know as usual just a, a great message great information and sometimes and a lot of times the word is just so good and here's what happens to me 
don't know about everybody else, but I hear something and it just hits me and strikes me. And the Holy Spirit is dealing with me on something. Right. And before I know it, two minutes is gone. You've gone on to something else. Now I'm trying to catch up. <laughs> That's what replays are for, right? <laughs> exactly. So you know, I get what I get, you know, and um, and, yeah. and all of us are at different places and stuff like that. And something hits hits one person, but doesn't hit another person. But that's what the Holy Spirit does. And he just makes that's it right. available for everybody. So he knew he was going to be on the call before the call. He knew what you were going to talk about yeah. before you were born. So uh, yeah. we, we hear about no accident. So I just say, keep up the good work. Keep going. Oh, thank you, brother. I mean, that just means the world to me because, you know, I mean, I'm here just to serve him and. You know, when I, I hear someone share like that, you know, it just humbles me, you know, that he, he is speaking through me. He's just, you know, gives me a message. And I tell you, I takes me to the woodshed and then I take you there. I mean, why should I be there by myself? <laughs> so I take you. <laughs> it's only fair. I mean, what do friends do? Right. But thank you. I just love you dearly. Thank you, David. Anybody else? Um, yeah. Uh, I Again, your words are always timely. Um, I thank you dearly. Um, as David mentioned, it's like, it's like I, I get caught up in something and, and you're, you, you're just full. You're so full of the word. And I'm so grateful for you and all of you online today uh, that d- pours out. You know, we're ready to, we're hungry. We're ready to receive. And, and even, I mean, I tell myself, I need to, I need this. Right. We all need it. But, um, but we have to fill ourselves up with it before we can, obviously, before we can share uh, with others. So thank you for your commitment and your obedience to the Lord. Thank That's you. That's my honor, my friend. Thank you so much. And you're right. And we, you know what? We need each other like never before. I mean, seriously. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's, I know the we went through all this with COVID, you know, don't forsake the assembly. Well, I understand that, but that no, it doesn't say concrete buildings necessarily. It's the assembly. So we're assembling here. And I'm not saying don't go to church. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm just saying is we need more of it, more of it, more of it, more of it. We're that intimate fellowship um, and sharing of God's word. We need it. You know, we need more of it. And so I've told you guys so many times, I'm, I'm honored the Lord is using me. But believe me, it's, it's me he's dealing with first. And, and, and I, I like that. I, you know, I want to be better for him. Right. I do. I, I, you know, the tough messages, I think that's why they keep on coming. But I want to be all that I can be for. I want to be found pleasing. I want to hear well done, good and faithful servant, right? Mm -hmm. But we do need each other. And I'm just thankful for you guys um, so much. Thank you, Suzanne. And thank you for keeping the light on because that's what I think of you. You always have your light on. We always have a place to come. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you so much. You've humbled me. Thank you. Anybody else? You know, Hebrews 11, talking about faith. I think it's verse 12. After all these people were listed about they didn't waver in their faith, they had faith for this and faith for that. I think it's verse 12 said, and God was not ashamed for them to call him their God. Yes. So that's that's, not, that's you know, that's big part to keep your faith up is so God won't be ashamed for us to get out and say, God's my God. You oh. know, so we want to make sure that I don't want him to be ashamed of me calling no. him God. I can tell you that. Oh, okay. it, I mean, that hurts. I mean, we we can't even imagine what it's like to be him, but most of us are parents, right? Yeah. Just imagine yeah. if we had a child, didn't give us a time of day, went out there, you know, doing all this, no no discipline, no commitment, no. I mean, you know, we we would be ashamed. <laughs> It'd still be our child, but we'd be ashamed. So that whole thought, just like, eh, I don't want to be ashamed of me either, Denise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oof, that's a scary you know um um lynn I, i'm gonna pop in again because i one of the last scriptures you talked about was elijah and elisha mm-hmm. i think it was uh the servant anyway um mm-hmm. and man you know that just really hit me um and i'm not going through per se anything right now but as i think about all the things i've been through or will go through i just keep in the back of my mind his his spiritual eyes were opened right you know, and uh, he's and he, there are more of them with us. Yes. I mean, no matter what, and, and see, and that was Old Testament. Yes. And and in Hebrews, I think it's thirteen eight says we have a better covenant established upon better promises. Right. So whatever they had, we got it, and then some. Yes. 
So, I mean, it, you know, it's just comforting. No matter what, they are more with us than are with them. They're, now, so therefore, if they're always more with us than they are with the enemy, what do we have to fear? Why are we whining and bellyaching and complaining? Or oh, do we believe the word or not? Amen. <laughs> you know That's it. It really does come down to that, David. I mean, seriously. Because that was I, good. I, I mean, I, my fire got lit. I mean, that's... <laughs> <laughs> well, and I've heard know, that scripture yeah. thousands of times. Yeah. But man, it's just, you know, the, one of my former pastors used to say, the Bible is forever pregnant. Oh. I giving birth to new facets of revelation. Oh, now that's beautiful. And and that just hit me as, I mean, there are, listen, no matter what we go through, there are more with us. And all with him. That's right. That's right. And I want to be that place, you know, where Elisha was right there in that moment that, you know, somebody comes and says, oh, man, we're in trouble. There's, you know, that I don't go look. I don't want to look. I, I see Elijah just saying, don't worry about it. You know, we got he's got it covered. There's more of us than there are of them without even looking, without falling into that fear for even one second. That's who I want to be when I grow up. If I grow up, <laughs> still working on that. But I love that too, David. And you're right. It's just always something new. And I love that, you know, when you'll just, like you said, you read something over and over and over. And then when the Lord's ready to put it, you know, something new in it, it's just like you read it, you know, not for the first time, but it's all new. I had a cousin that said this to me one time. She said it to me a long time ago. Um, and the impact is, is even, is even better now. Uh, and adding with what, with what the prophet told his uh, servant, she went on to say, nothing has caught God by surprise. No. He knew it was coming before it came. And, and the Bible also says, for every temptation, test, or trial in Corinthians, he's made a way of escape. Not that he's going to make a way of escape. Right. He's already made it. Already done it. <laughs> so, so why would he, so people have a, why would he make a way of escape if he put us in it? He didn't put us in it. So that's why he made a way. That's, it. that's exactly right. Yeah, you're right. So, so he that's saw it. it coming already. So I'm taking care of, you know, all we have is the present and the future. So he, he saw everything. And so I'm, I'm, I'm set. Now, that, now that may sound arrogant. That may sound cocky. But no, no it's not. It's what I believe. It's what the word <laughs> says. That's right. It's a done deal. It's already been done. It was written Amen. before the foundations. You're right. Yeah. And that's why I think, you know, especially the, you know, the spiritual wars raging, uh, I believe, like never before, at least not in our lifetime. You know, we've got uh, we were talking about a couple of weeks ago. There's like three voices, if you will. You talk to yourself. If, if you're like me, you talk to yourself, talk to myself. <laughs> OK. And, and I was just saying last night to a friend of mine that, you know, I have the sign in the kitchen that says, of course, I talk to myself. Sometimes I need expert advice. So, you know, you talk to yourself. Right. But then you should be in the word and in the spirit. And if you are, you will hear the spirit of God. He's talking to you. He's guiding you. You know, he's trying to lead you up, right? He's, he's over here. And, but if you're not careful, that other mess you hear, that's all demonic. You can't do it. You shouldn't do it. You won't do it. You know, all the, the things that he beats us up with. So we got to be so much into his word and his spirit that we only hear one voice. That's the bottom line. And so it, these times, it, it's not for wussies. It's time to, you know, separate the men from the boys and get on with it. It's not a time for wussies. You know, we've seen that, uh, how many people struggle through COVID and all the unknowns. And again, if you can get people scared, of, you know, you can get them to do anything. And so that's what we've seen is people just, they're scared to go to church. They're scared to, they're still scared to breathe the same air. They're scared to do anything. They're buying into so many things that, you know, we don't need to make it politicize this, but it's because of fear. They're fearful. They're lost. They're scared. Well, we, we, he's already, no, it didn't take him by surprise. He's not surprised by any of it, you know, and there's more of us <laughs> than there are of them. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's preaching now. Okay. So uh, Denise, I think you were going to say something, weren't you, hon? A few minutes ago, you well, wanted to I was just going to say, you know, even when Elijah, you when he said there's more of them than there, you know, of them, all of us, right. meaning they're surrounded by holy angels. But, you know, in Hezekiah's time, God just sent one angel through the camp and slew 180,000 men. 
That's right. That's right. And he's going to have to send but one angel to take care of 180,000 problems you might have. Yeah. Oh, so boy. It's, you know, it's God. Just whatever God says he's going to do, it's going to be. I don't care. He, all he has to do is will it. He don't have to send angels. That's all he has to do is will it to happen, and it will. That's just so true. Yeah. That's so true. That's, that's just real big to me right there, his will. Absolutely. Yeah. I and trusting as well, yeah. I live. Yes, hey. This is Chet. Um, I typically don't say much in these in these readings. I just listen and and, le and learn and study. But this uh, reading today was especially gave me a real deep feeling of of experiencing a miracle in my life, and that happened when I was seven years old. But I was I was in Poland, and I was on a train to Auschwitz. And at those times, the uh, uh, it, it was in a cattle train, and uh, the there was no roofs in those cattle trains. So basically, uh, people were packed in in those wagons very tightly, and they knew they were going to Auschwitz. Of course. Uh, I was small. I didn't know what was happening, mm -hmm. but but I did realize uh, one the way the miracle, miracle happened is when my wife, not my wife, my my mother had me and my and my brother. They received a little matchbox. Inside the matchbox was a little message, and the message said, "Mrs. Chesney, if you're in this wagon, take your children, and." Exit it immediately, and wow. uh, and that mess that matchbox came miraculously mer because it went from one wagon to the other. They were throwing this matchbox one over the other until they found us. So uh, it's a compelling message, uh, messages of opening your eyes to the miracles, and that miracle really happened to me. Wow. So I I really appreciate that. Praise God. So it was like, a, and, and there was no rhyme or reason for how it showed up. It was just there with the message. Praise God. Exactly. Look at that. I mean, his love is just overwhelming. That is so beautiful. Thank you so much for that. And yeah, I mean, we miracles do exist. I mean, gosh, it's how horrible it is for us to serve a mighty God and think that stuff doesn't exist. I mean, come on. <laughs> That's a beautiful story. Thank you so much for sharing with us tonight. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, Lynn, I, I just wanted to say one more thing. We says that my internet connection is unstable. But anyway, uh, I'm on a different prayer call, as you know, Monday through Friday. And, uh, and when we talk about miracles, there have been a boatload of miracles that we have seen, the people that are on that prayer call, that we have seen and been witness to for people who called in or sent a text and asked for prayers or 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 all of that you know and um uh so we bear witness and every time i'm i am just amazed and and truly blessed that we had a very tiny 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 part in that mm -hmm. and and that you know god worked through us to put that miracle into the world and uh, uh i am you know i am totally humbled by that every time it happens and uh, and totally amazed and and then the other thing is there was a meme going around this week that, that i saw on facebook and it 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 was talking about you know are if you're talking to yourself are are you are you crazy you know and i said i said no there are people who do talk to themselves and that's okay. And there are you, it, and if you even answer yourself, that's okay. But if you ever catch yourself going, huh? Yeah. <laughs> that's not okay. <laughs> You've stepped over the line. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't be good. That wouldn't be good. But I love that, Michael. And you know, to me, it's like, uh, there's no such thing as a big sad little sad. There's no such thing as a big miracle, little miracle, right? It, it's all just amazing. And 
I think that God, again, I know in my life, I mean, we, we sometimes say he's an 11th hour God, you know, you're sitting there like, okay, God, <laughs> as if he's forgotten you, right? Okay, God. But, you know, it's just like with the army, you know, uh, you know, I think sometimes he's just like taking it a little bit at a time. Okay, where's your faith? I mean, he, that's not what was happening there. He just wanted to be known. It was me, like the matchbook. Can't explain it. It showed up, a little note, saved the whole family, basically. That's God. And I think he wants everybody to know, you know, that that's God. And so that's what we come in to be able to share um, these miracles and things that happen in our lives, just to, to be a living testimony to the power of God. And, and you hear me say often that, you know, if we can't ever share a testimony about not necessarily just miracles, but what he's done in our life, like me, I was a wretch, I, you know, if we can't ever share what he's done for us and to us, why would anybody need Jesus? I mean, he's like, yeah, he's a nice guy, but he hasn't really done anything for me, but you need him. I mean, how do we, come on, we need to be able to express no matter what that looks like. And again, there's no, I know plenty of people, well, not plenty, but a, a number of people that just grew up in Christian homes. They just love Jesus from day one. You know, it's just been a faithful journey. Uh, it's a natural kind of thing that and where I come from. Okay. But even those people, you know, what is the testimony there? The testimony of the generational prayers and faith that still sustain today. That's the testimony. But if we don't ever speak it, what, why would anybody want our Jesus? That's I mean, right. for heaven's sake, you know, thank you. Anybody else? Okie dokie. Oh, Sharon, I didn't see you out there, girl. I'm just now looking off screen to see your name. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing good, Lynn. Hey, I appreciate your, I appreciate the word. I appreciate your words this evening. Very much. All's good. Um, I'm one of those pursuers, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, 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 you know, I, can, I don't understand how people can only live on 15 minutes of God a week. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, you know, that, I, I just don't know how that works. In fact, listening to your little testimony there, uh, it sounded like mine, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't I didn't come out from one of those very, you know, I wasn't brought up in Christian family. We had all the dysfunction there, too. Mm -hmm. But God is, you know, I can I, I, I can look back on my life and see how God has has, you know, you can track those times in your life when you've had those experiences that's that right. you cannot deny. And I think that, I think where we are is a lot of people just don't have a, a deep revelation of the love of God in their life. Yeah, and I think, I think that's t missing in people's life. I think they have, they know about God, a, a head knowledge, but the heart is missing something. Right. And um, I've had several occasions in my life where I've experienced the deep, that, you know, how much God loves me. Mm -hmm. And, and each time I kind of get a new revelation of that, it seems to be deeper. Right. I got stuck in Ephesians last month. Just, um, I love the passion translation. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that, but I think it's a wonderful translation. And, mm -hmm. um, I got stuck in Ephesians on Paul's prayers to the Ephesians. Right. And if you, you know, you think about you think about God's word, you know, when God spoke the word and created the world, right. those words are still forming new creations all the time. Right. I mean, it, it's still creating, you know? And so I had never really thought of Paul's prayers, the Ephesians as being something that was evident today and they were for us. And right. those words of Paul's prayers are still going out over all of God's children. Absolutely. That's right. And the one I got stuck in was the very first one, Ephesians, which Paul prays to um, that the Ephesians have the wisdom mm -hmm. and the revelation of God. Right. And I got, and, and those prayers are just, Paul's prayers to the churches are just amazing. Oh, and yeah. It, and, and it's all there, you know? And so anyway, I just... I just don't know how people survive without God. I, before I was ever saved, I was in a drowning car. Um, I had, I got caught in a rainstorm and 
I had, I didn't realize it at the time, but it was, it was one of those situations where um, no one could have heard me. The rain was so hard. I was living in an area where there was like um, big drainage ditches and, and it was a flood zone really. And um, I don't know where, where this came, I don't know what happened. I mean, I looked out my window and there was someone standing there, but my car was floating and uh, the water was coming in. It was about chest deep on me. And I looked out my window and I saw a plaid shirt and a belt buckle and khaki pants. <laughs> wow. And um, so he said, I heard you. And, and as I look back, I, I, there, there was no way that anybody could have heard me. It was raining so hard. And there was things coming into my car from people's gardens and it was very, it, and I couldn't get out of my car. And so I realized later he carried me clear across a, over to another, almost a block away, knocked on this lady's door. And he said, uh, would you help, would you help her and let her use your phone? And, and, and I, I simply thought it was a neighbor or hers or something. And, um, so I asked her later, I said, who was that man? She says, I have no idea. I've never seen it before. And that was it. He was gone. And so I always knew that it had to be an angel. I just feel like, I mean, it, there was no other explanation. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I've had similar experiences where it was undoubtedly, um, you know, miraculous uh, saving of my life. Yes. Just and, to, yeah. And I, yeah. I'll tell you that, I mean. You know, if it doesn't uh, do it for you, that you live a life as a wretch, right? And then well, I was living as a wretch during that time. So, <laughs> yeah, but, but then you see the hand of God, and you know, if it wasn't enough, you just see how He saved you for such a time as this. And that, that I, I, I know I say that a lot, but it's it's profound to me to think about all the times we could be, you know, brought into this world. We're brought for a purpose, a per specific time, and here we are in the world uh, of a cesspool. And I know I'm so honored, you know, that I was born for such a time as this and I'm not wasting a minute of it. I, I'm not either. And yeah. we're needed. We are needed. Yeah. Very needed in this in this world today. People yeah. have tremendous amounts of fear. Champion. Perfect, oh, perfect, perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect love casts out fear. Yes, and absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing, my friend. Anybody else before we go? Well, another um, one message uh lynn thank you daryl and then if you did if you didn't challenge us we could go anywhere in town and not be challenged so that's why we're here every sunday night <laughs> that's right that's right well i guess he you know he's refining his bold uh vessel over here and like i said i don't go to woodshed by myself so you know thank you daryl it's always an honor in case thank i you. forget um we won't be gathering on easter sunday but we will be um, gathering for communion uh, on the 10th, I believe it is. So don't forget that. Anybody you know, especially those people, maybe they're shut in, they can't get out, or maybe they just haven't returned to church after COVID. And there's a lot of people there. Uh, please let people know, you know, because I remember the first time we did communion here online, there were people were just very moved that they had an opportunity, um, you know, to share communion. And, and it's not... Um, it doesn't offend God, believe me, when he knows the heart behind it, he doesn't, it doesn't offend him that we're going to share this online. So just keep that in mind. That'll be April 10th. And um, I'll remind you plenty of times before then. Anything else? Lynn, this is Doug Todd. Thank you so much. I appreciate you inviting me and I appreciate all the time that you put into preparing for this. This truly was a blessing to hear this tonight. And this will be the first of many. Thank you so much. We're so glad to have you and look forward to you being back next week. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. The Lord has. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, I guess we'll close it out. Uh, Denise, could I ask you, my friend, if you would pray for us? I sure would. I love to pray. That's my favorite thing. Lord, we just come to you to gather, God. We come to you and we ask you to bless Lynn. Lord, she prepares and she cares and she prays for us. She prays your will be done. She tells it like it is. Lord, we just ask you to pour out, just open up the windows of heaven and just pour out so much on her she cannot even contain it. And Lord, just thank you for the person that sowed into this ministry. 
the five thousand dollars or we just ask you to bless them thank you jesus and lord we just thank you that you're going to set this revival up at the perfect time the time that you have and uh if don't let the wrong people be there, God. Don't let the people be there that's going to be uh, criticizing and stuff like that. They're not going to be delivered, and they're not going to be praying for and not be agreeing, Lord. Just keep them at home, <laughs> Lord, so could, because this is an important revival. Lord, the enemy wouldn't be coming at it like he does. Amen. And so, God, we just thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for everything that everybody's had to say tonight that, put, that shared with this and added to God. We just thank you for that, God, because it's all about you. And, and Lord, I just thank you that we're in a, a group of people right now that, that is all about you, God. Yes, Lord. That we all want to please you. We all want to worship you. We all want to read your word. We all want to pray to you, God. It's all about you. Mm-hmm. But God, this is going on YouTube. So we ask you to get people that are not saved and are not mature, God, that they would stop while they're scrolling through. Got them to this, uh, this and all the other um uploads or whatever how you say it god just cause him to to draw them to it like a magnet god Mm -hmm. and cause him to listen to it lord and be delivered and be saved god and we thank you for that too lord we ask you to keep us all safe keep our family and kin safe Lord. we just thank you right now that we'll do everything that we can this week to make you not ashamed for us to call you our Um. god and we love you for it, God. We love you for what you've done. If you don't do anything else for us, Lord, you died for us. Yes. And so that we can have eternal life, God. That's enough right there to send us shout and run on through eternity. Mm-hmm. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name. Jesus Amen. Name. Oh, I love to hear my sister pray. Thank you so much, my friend. Uh, yeah, so you guys keep in mind, if there's any way for you to be here on May 12th, um, come to the farm. It's going to be a miraculous time. It's just amazing. And I, I appreciate uh, Denise's heart to understand all. <laughs> it's a lot going on. Uh, you know, the enemy would love to get in the way of that, but he's not going to. And so thank you for your no, prayers. He's not. he's not going to. So thank you for That's that. Right. I'll be praying for you that you feel better, my friend. And you guys know where to find me. You got any other prayer requests or anything? I'm always here for you. I love you dearly. And I'll see you guys next time. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Thanks, God bless.